Hello wonderful people. Since currently I'm living in this wonderful place and I'm surrounded by loads of fascinating, smart and intelligent people, therefore I decided to capture this moment. I decided to dig deeper into these personalities, to learn more about their research and to learn more about how they perceive life. Therefore this time I'm talking with Angelo Vermulen. He's an artist, biologist and a space system researcher at Delft University. His interdisciplinary approach between art, engineering and science is definitely encouraging. He's also working towards biological systems and life support in space, which is completely another level and I'm deeply passionate and I would like to know more about how to grow food in outer space. Therefore, enjoy this conversation, be curious and uh, see you next time. How were you as a child? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, because of my 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 um, multidisciplinary background, right? Um, I was very very much the same as a child. I've always been interested in the things that I'm actually doing now. Actually, it's it's like this. I'm actually doing what I was interested in as a kid. I've, I've been very uh, lucky um, that I could build my life around my interests, which I've already always carried with me. Um, and as a kid, I was actually very interested from a very early age in science and biology. Um, I would I would just go out into the fields with binoculars to observe all types of birds and um, to collect uh, samples from, from little streams and then to check them under my microscope. So, you know, I was always interested in all these, in all these things. Um, and I even published a science magazine, when, which I started when I was 12, writing my mm -hmm. own articles with a friend and then, you know, it's kind of a DIY zine that we sold in school very cheap, but, you know, it was a little, a little thing that I did back in the days. And um, at the same time, I was always interested in the arts and in culture in general. Um, and I would be very much interested in literature and photography and history. And these are exactly the things that I'm still doing now. I'm, I'm not running around in the fields taking samples from rivers and streams right now, but I made a PhD on water quality. So, you know, <laughs> somehow it all, it's all connected. But it was always a hands-on experience that I can see, right? Uh, um, do it yourself. Uh, uh, of course, yes. the curious mind is driven. Uh, the, yeah, your, your mind is curiosity driven, as I can see. But also, you know, it's not only it happens in your head, but you're going and trying it out uh, yes, as far as exactly. I can feel it. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah, the, I think the hands-on uh, aspect is has always been very very important to me because biology is one of those scientific fields which is very uh, tangible. It's very uh, hard to put it. Um, if you move to other areas like chemistry and physics, it can become quite abstract. Um, and there are many levels in biology which are very tangible, especially ecology uh, has a lot to do with you know observing and being out in the field and doing lab experiments and everything. So I think that's always been been quite important to me. And on the other hand, I, I've always loved um, building and creating my own uh, my own things. I had a little lab that I built when I was a kid, which was you know was was not like a children's lab. It was with an actual microscope and actual equipment and stuff, and um, running experiments and watching things through the microscope and everything. So it's always there's always been a very tangible component there. Yes. So uh, what would be your advice for the people who are like uh, stuck in their heads and they would like to put um, to, to create things with their ha own hands, but uh, you know, it's, it's something is missing sometimes here. You know, uh, maybe a little bit more courage is needed or how to make it happen in reality. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think getting a little bit of support, um, I mean, especially for kids, uh, getting a little bit of support from, from your family and parents is, is quite helpful. Uh, my parents were quite supportive. They, they gave me space to do all this. Um, at a certain point, I even um, found uh, and received old do, um, darkroom equipment from my father and grandfather. Um, and I got a space at home in a, in a kind of a, a sort of bigger closet. And I built my own darkroom to develop um, photos that I made of the stars. Now, 
I still have some of these photos. That it's really like just a black photo with just a few light dots. It was a big deal for me, but it's like <laughs> aesthetically or scientifically, it didn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it doesn't. It, it's it's it, yeah. it makes sense. It's not very very important or anything. Um, but of course, getting that support is it, it, kind of key. But uh, yes, then again, um, nowadays the days the days are times are very different. You can just look so many things up on on, on YouTube and get all these instructional videos. So just trying out things is now so much easier, I guess. Um, so I'm not, I'm not so sure, you know, why? Um, I think um, it, from an educational perspective, maybe this is what is lacking, that people learn to experiment outside of the, of the, of the typical things that are expected from you. And it's almost like in schools, you would, you would need um, some some open space for people to uh, to to discover what hacking means, you know, hardware hacking, and improvising, and being resourceful with little, limited means just to improvise a solution and stuff like this. I think this would be really good skills to uh, to teach kids. Yeah, that, that's why maybe the the Lego business is quite uh, successful, right? Because that's how it <laughs> works, like, right? These building. That's blocks. very true. That's very very true. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, and what about art? Uh, so, um, so you were making these films, and um, yeah, I don't know. So you were mostly interested within the photography aspect, or how it developed further. Yeah, uh, well, the, my original interest was really in the field of photography, absolutely. Um, and once again, um, I had this interest from a very young age, and I experimented with black and white photography. Um, and then, like I said. Um, I built my own dark room with some equipment from my, my family, um, started experimenting with that. And then, and then I kind of dropped it for a while and I picked it up years later um, and actually went to art school. Um, it was an evening and weekend program um, uh, when I was doing my, my PhD in biology. So in the day I would be in the lab and in the evening I would be in the dark room in the photo studio uh, working, on, uh, working on photography. But I evolved from photography to all kinds of other uh, creative fields. And it started with picking up uh, video as a medium, uh, experimenting, making, making videos um, and video installations, like mm. you know, in, in, in spaces projecting and, and trying to experiment with concepts and combining different types of images. Um, and then that evolved into actual installation art. With, with not just with images, but with actual physical objects that I that I um, yeah. that I put together, and and so I really gradually evolved from one medium to another. And if if, if you're asking me, um, yeah, what do people need to you know to be more hands on and to experiment? Well, the first thing is just to start somewhere. Um, but uh, I think the the social context of, of is important as well. Just doing things on your own for yourself, of course, is, is, is not very motivational. So finding a, a social context, which is either um, inspirational or encourages you to, to, to do things. And also um, finding platforms to share things and to get feedback is really crucial. And I think mm -hmm. to keep going. Um, so I think those are really important. I, I remember when I was um, uh, developing myself as an artist, that uh, quickly finding opportunities to exhibit work um, mm -hmm. and to receive feedback and to engage in conversations about what I tried to communicate was really key to keep me going. Um, and uh, I think that's that's one of the one of the key aspects in, in, in stepping out of your comfort zone and doing these yeah. kind of experiments, whether they be in, in, in engineering in your garage or scientific research you're doing on your own or arts experiments, um, yeah, building that building that context around it oh, that yeah th that's quite inspiring and uh truly uh, yeah it makes me think that uh yeah I sh sometimes i do think that i'm putting myself on the stage enough but then i realize that maybe not that in enough as you know sometimes you have all these mental bl uh, blockages in, in the in the mind you, you at some point it seems to be sufficient but in reality way more is needed to um, yeah, to get more feedback, to communicate with the people are, uh, around and uh, to implement that, yeah. It depends. It really depends on your needs. I mean, not everybody has that need to communicate and to be out there and to communicate with other people. 
Um, some people are more private, even in their experiments, and that's fine as well. Um, but I think there's always, um, there is this switch between when something is a hobby and when you want to step up from a hobby. Um, I could have kept a lot of my, my interests in, on, on the level of a hobby, but I, I, I developed them more properly. Um, and I think that's, that's where, where people are not used to do that because we are very much living in a, in a kind of old fashioned system, um, which comes an education, old fashioned educational system or an educational logic where everybody agrees that we need to move on and we need to be more transdisciplinary. We need to be more open. Um, in terms of thinking about, you know, how to, how, to, how, to, how to shape people or how to allow people to grow and develop. But nevertheless, when you look at what's actually happening in education, it's often still very old fashioned. And even little kids are being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like that question alone is already showing, listen, kid, you need to make choices here. You need to do one thing here, which is, you know, it's, it's very pervasive, this idea that you have to invest all your energy, all your talent, all your passion into one single thing, because then you might stand out and you might be successful. The idea that you can develop yourself along multiple paths and then learning how to actively connect those paths is very much absent. And I think that's actually where the strength of, of a future generation could be, because we're much more nowadays, of course, because of digital media, um, um, there is so much more connections that could be made, but not everybody easily makes that connection. I mean, it's the same thing what you just asked, right? Like how, what advice would you give people um, to start something based like something more experimental, uh, tangible, you know, working with something on a personal project, um, which sounds almost like a contradiction because all these instruction videos are out there. You're like, it should be, it hasn't been ever as easy as nowadays. And still there's, like you said, all these mental, yeah, mental blockages, mental hurdles that yeah. stop you from doing that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, in some sense, it feels uh, um, that, uh, yeah, all, all these aspects are kind of um, at the moment in, in my life at the same time, I'm also changing a lot of perspectives. At some point I was like, no, I have to go in, um, in a wide range of activities. I should develop myself uh, as a, in a holistic approach. Now, when I came to, uh, to Wageningen, now it's very, a lot of focus is you have to be the best in this particular fear, find your niche, be very specific, be very clear. And, uh, and then, then all these ideas are coming like, okay, maybe I should just focus in this particular area. Maybe I should, uh, um, it, some sort of reductionist approach appears and then uh, okay exactly, maybe i shouldn't yeah. do those things because they're not truly beneficial because i'm not creating anything and instead mm -hmm. i should just focus on that one one big thing <laughs> i understand is, there, there, yeah. there are basically two things that i can say about this first of all um you really need to look at your needs and your own capacities that's really key and it's really crucial um some people really thrive focusing because they can they can they can switch off so much distractions and they can go really deep with a tremendous sensitivity for all the details of a particular field or a particular challenge which is beautiful um, other people um, need to build connections between things it doesn't mean that they're always superficial because that's the other point i want to bring up but they thrive much more in in in, in building connections for me, I need, I actually need a bit of both. Yeah. Uh, I love to build connections and I work extremely transdisciplinary. I mean, there are people, many people that, you know, work in some sort of transdisciplinary way, but what we are doing uh, at Dallas University of Technology, for example, uh, working in, with my team on interstellar exploration and coming up with new concepts for building spaceships that could enable interstellar exploration is we're really approaching from, from a cloud of fields, basically. But on the other hand, um, I'm fascinated by going in depth in at least a few of those fields. Uh, one day I'm really working on chemical equations and the other moment I'm thinking about theoretical architecture, conceptual architecture. So it's really jumping around between those two things. So on, there are different types of people with different needs and this is really what you need to figure out for yourself. So 
it's not the outside world that sh should uh, tell you what to do. You really need to figure out what you want to, what you need. And then the other thing is that um, we do need both. There is no point in, in having a whole team of connectors. That is not very optimal. And having an entire team of specialists without proper facilitation, that will not work either. So you really need a mix of, of these approaches. So it's not about which, which is, is best, you know, it's, it's just two ways to deal with the world and to deal with curiosity. And you just need to be encouraged to make a choice without feeling guilty about it. Like, oh my God, maybe this is not the right path because let it, let's be clear, you can be very successful in both because of the, sec the following reasons. If you specialize, and this is what you said, just said, you can go so deep that nobody else has this level of knowledge and you become a bit unique in that particular field. And that, you know, provides you with a particular position and, and a sort of uh, future. On the other hand, um, every single person has a unique constellation of interests. I mean, everybody has this very particular set of interests. And if you manage to build bridges between those, that makes you a unique person because you can, in, in my cases, I can talk about contemporary art and about biology and about interstellar travel, and about community engagement, and I can blend it into one story. And it's a unique story because nobody yeah. combines it the way I do. And that's another path. So these are really two choices. Yeah, uh, that's quite fascinating and inspiring. So thank you for sharing all this. And uh, well, then, so could you tell me more about how space appeared uh, in your life and how you managed to combine the, the, the biology, the research uh, and, and space and maybe later on the, the, how art became part of all this conjunction? Yeah, it's, it's um, the thing is, I am very interested in emergent design and, and in emergent processes. And it's not just as, a, as an actual scientific topic, but also on a meta level. Uh, I think I approach life completely through emergence. Um, none of what I'm, none of the things that I'm doing now, um, and none of the positions that I have now were planned ever. I don't plan very much. You know, it's I, 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 I'm I'm strategic, and it's not like I don't I don't consider which moves to make. But I don't have a a big master plan. I don't have a big career goal like this that needs to be happening. Um, it's more like putting together the things that are present and then making step-by-step -step developments. And um, I mean, there is a whole background story. I will summarize it now, but it's really, as I will explain it, you will see how it is really by what I just talked about, by embracing these multiple interests and resisting the pressure from society to make one choice and then stick to it, that I actually managed to develop myself in the way I did now. So I started studying biology, did a PhD in biology, very specialized. I was specialized in deformities of the teeth of larva of non-biting midges. So that's a very typical, particular scientific subject. You're like, why on earth would you do this? Well, the thing is, these larvae, they live in, in streams and, and, and rivers and ponds. And when the aquatic, these aquatic ecosystems are polluted, their teeth start to deform. So you can use it as a biomonitoring tool, basically. So it, it is, you know, it, it makes some sense. But, ne yeah. but nevertheless, you're looking at the world through a microscope, day after day after day. And I was like, eh, this is not going to be enough for me. It's just too, it's too specialized. Um, but I was always interested in the arts, and I was actually really interested in in. in documentary photography, documentary filmmaking. So I decided during my, my PhD research um, to do uh, evening, evening classes in photography. And I did that for four years, finished my PhD, finished my photo photography studies. And by that time, time, I got so passionate about the arts in general, not just photography, that I gave myself one year to just fully dedicate to the arts. And I was like, you know, you could step out of academia for one year. It's not too, not too bad. You could, it's difficult to yeah. step out, for example, for 10 years and then go back. But one year, well, that's okay, which I did. And then after one year, I was like, I want to be a full-time artist. I don't want to go back to science. You know, this is my passion. So I thought that was it. I thought that was my <laughs> the rest of my life. Of course, that, that was not true at all. So I started developing myself as an artist. And very quickly, I picked up my biology again. Because in the beginning, when I was making art, I really put science aside, including biology. I just needed this, this to take a bit of a step back. 
but then my biology interests i'm i'm by nature a biologist it's just in, it's just so deeply ingrained in me um, that i've started making bio art artworks including biological processes where the the organisms would co-create with me um, in all kinds of ways and that that led to pretty complicated installations with computers and plants and large-scale structures that I built with other people all over the world. And that actually led me to an invitation from the European Space Agency um, to basically were inviting me if I would be interested to, to, to work with them on a particular research program as an external uh, researcher, not mm. as, a, as part of the European Space Agency. And the program is called MELISA. It's a regenerative ecosystem for future space settlement. It's basically a, an, an ecosystem that recycles all human waste, everything that comes out of a human body, every molecule is being recycled and turned into a plant, into, into crops again, and the crops provide food and oxygen for the astronauts. So it's a pretty, it's a bit more complex than I'm summarizing it now, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, the heart of it. And I was immediately fascinated. I was technology, it was yeah. space, it was the future, biology, and that's how I ended up, um, yeah stepping back into science but this time more in the field of, of space and now i'm working at delft university of technology working more on, on on let's say advanced concepts which means thinking about concepts that are a little bit out there it's not immediately these concepts cannot be immediately um, developed yet it's a bit more theoretical um, but it, it includes uh, thinking about ecology and space Ecology in space. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, uh, as, as, as you, you probably have noticed, there is a lot going on in, in, in terms of the development in, in the field of space exploration. I mean, there are all kinds of things. It's almost in the news every day, because, of course, the, the private space industry is developing really fast. And it's not just Elon Musk. There are many other part, uh, uh, parties involved. Um, and on the other hand, there is the, the race to the moon which is becoming quite um, intense at this point. I mean, it's not like it's uh, it's something they're talking about. It's actually happening right now as we speak. There's multiple components of going back to the moon, of the infrastructure of going back that is needed to go back to the moon are currently in development. Very recently, um, contract was signed between the European Space Agency and NASA to, um, to develop a new space station, smaller one, but circling around the moon. It's called the Gateway. For all kinds of programs to go back to the moon, to the surface of the moon, different moon landers are in preparation, different nations are working on it. So the next 10 years, human civilization is finally going to be, how to put it, uh, properly present on the moon. And I think to stay. I don't think what's, we're going to see what happened in the 60s and 70s. That there were a few visits and then the program just broke down. I think we're going to stay on the moon from now onward. So these are really big changes. Um, now, what you can sense is that it is very different than from what we've we've done before. Um, what we've done before were relatively short stays in space. Even in the space station, yes, there were stays of up to one year, for example. Um, but the idea of keeping people in space over longer periods of time is becoming more and more part of the future narratives of Mars missions, living on the surface of Mars, etc. Now, the thing is. Um, Everything you have to ship to space, of course, is extremely expensive. Um, if you travel to space, you want to, if you travel to Mars, for example, uh, and even on a moon base, you want to recycle as much as you can. We can recycle quite a bit and the International Space Station, of, for example, the water can be recycled quite well. It's an energy intensive system, so it's not the most long term sustainable system, but it's very efficient. Um, but we're also thinking about food. Um, at a certain point, you will have people living remotely from Earth for extended periods of time. It would make perfect sense that they would start growing at least a part of their own uh, food supply. Um, and so there are all kinds of concepts there that are in development. Uh, it's called space farming. That's, that's one way to call it. Uh, it's not science fiction. There is actual research being done there. And there are a few concepts. And the main concepts are either you keep on shipping nutrients and seeds to, to space, and then the astronauts work with that, or, and this is much more interesting, you recycle the waste of humans to, to drive um, an agricultural system. 
And uh, what happens is basically, what you can do is basically you can use a series of different microorganisms and they all have different uh, biochemical processes going on, um, living in different bioreactors. And you basically pump all the waste of humans um, through these bioreactors and gradually step by step, these molecules are broken down and they're turned into nutrients that you can use for the crops. Um, and then the crops, because of course plants produce oxygen, they provide oxygen for the astronauts and they also provide all the calories and, and vitamins that are needed. Um, and this is a, a circular way of thinking. And, and, and this whole idea of circularity is key when we think about the future of mankind in space. We will not be as wasteful on, in space as on Earth because we simply we can't afford it and it wouldn't make sense. And, and that's why this kind of research is so interesting because you, really, you can really learn all, quite a bit of lessons from space and bring them back to Earth. Yeah, some people are saying that, uh, you know, why we are going to the space, maybe you should solve the problems on Earth and then maybe we should move on. But at the same time, exactly. uh, at the same time, it's, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, of course, the oceans are still needs to be explored. They are so deep, uh, full of uh, much more interesting creatures, right? Not only humans on two or, or animals on four feet, right? The oceans are much more spectacular, but at the same time, the space, huh? yeah. Why, why wouldn't we uh, apply the principles out there as well? And then we can actually bring that the, the principles back home, right? Like the circular economy approach in, uh, yes. in greenhouses, right? Yes. Um, the thing is the argument of um, why sh shouldn't we be taking care of Earth, Earth first before we go to space? It basically pits... Um, caring for the earth against space, mm -hmm. which, is, which is weird and which is actually a fallacy, which is wrong. Uh, and this is for two reasons. First of all, space technology and the outer layer of space, the layer of space technology to be created around the earth. And yes, there is space debris. Of course, that's one of the problems, but there's a lot of mostly functional infrastructure out there. So this, 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 this layer of space infrastructure around the earth is an integral part of human civilization right now. It's not something you can shut off or you can pull, you can pull out of civilization. It's integrated. Um, space is not any longer out there, but space is more like an extension of human civilization that just extended from the surface of the earth a, few, a bit deeper into space and it will keep extending. This human civilization will keep extending and standing like a bubble more and more into the solar system. So this is this, well, this it's not idea. like universes are all the time expanding, right? According yeah, well, to Yeah, that's someone. a different story. That's, that's <laughs> a different, that's, and a different scale. Um, but it's it's the idea that that somehow space is kind of something you can switch off or something that is a luxury, which is not the case at all. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's interwoven. It's, it's with, with, with what we're doing here on Earth. Um, and secondly, and a second important aspect in this discussion is that we use, space is being used to, to take care of Earth. We would have, we only discovered climate change because of the space infrastructure that's here now. We can only follow climate change and we can only understand climate change and learn how to mitigate the effects of climate change because of the whole infrastructure of satellites, weather satellite, earth observation. Um, so it's really not about do we should first take care of earth and then go to space. No, we need to develop both in the right way, of course, with the right focus, which is a focus of sustainability and of balance uh, and not of extraction and exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So, so what, uh, what about, um, yeah, yeah. So I, when I was contacting you, I was referring to the, your, to the paper, what horticulture and space exploration can learn, learn from each other, the mission to Mars initiative in the Netherlands. And, um, yeah, could you share some of the insights about it? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, um, a lecture series that I set up with, um, with uh, some of my colleagues at uh, Delft University of Technology um, a in 2018. And it was a, a lecture series that was specifically aimed at 
exploring how the world of horticulture, which is a very important um, economic sector in the Netherlands, by the way, there's a lot of advanced uh, horticulture going on in this country. Um, of, it was basically a program that was investigating what both worlds could learn from each other, the horticulture sector and the space uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very interesting because it's, in the beginning, of course, you're like, okay, how, how can horticulture learn from space? I mean, that's what most people immediately thought of because space is such a, a highly technological field. There are all kinds of ways in which horticulture could learn from that. And we're thinking about the general circular thinking that I just explained is something that would be that's really interesting uh, for for horticulture uh, waste recycling like what I described in the Melissa system uh, but also things like sensing sensors um, and control sensing and control of water and climate for example uh, things like automation and robotics from space that could pot potentially be applied on earth uh, also in space you have to really optimize your usage of space Get, uh, you have to work in a very compact way. So those are there are possible lessons that could be learned. So there's kind of a, a range of technologies and, and, and uh, that we, we could take from space and bring back to innovate horticulture. But very quickly during the development of this program, we, we saw that it actually goes both ways. That space exploration can also benefit and learn from horticulture. It's not just a one-way conversation. And this is mostly uh, relevant when we're talking about large scale food production. Right now, there have been a lot of experiments with plants and crops in space. It started in the 40s, the first seeds were sent to space. Many people don't know this, but it's, it's, an, it's already for decades that people, uh, scientists are interested to explore um, uh, agriculture in space. And in the early 80s, the first plants were grown in space. But the thing is, a lot of those experiments about plants and seeds in space are small scale. Uh, and they're very focused on space biology, understanding the effects of space and the growth of plants, for example, the impact of radiation, the impact of zero gravity. So but, it's some, in some sense, trying to comprehend that the physics out there is yes, the same and, as in, on yes. Earth. Yeah. Yes, it's space biology. It's the field of space biology. And it really focuses on what are the effects of the space environment on biological organisms yeah. that are actually not yeah. really used to space. Now, the thing is, um, we need to, if we're talking about space settlement, uh, bringing people to space, larger groups of people for extended periods of time, we need calories. It's not going to be enough to be able to grow two lattices and to be very ha happy about it. That's not going to cut it. You know, you need to grow a lot of vegetables, a lot of potatoes or rice or wheat, whatever you want to grow. And so for that, for that larger scale approach, you can, it would be really useful to start talking with horticulturists because they, day in, day out, they are in the middle of producing huge quantities of, of food. And they have a sort of knowledge that is slightly different than uh, traditional scientific knowledge. I call you could call it tacit knowledge. It's this, this feeling on, it's not just, it's not like they, they, they grow their crops just by intuition, but there is a, an experience and a, and a practical experience with growing food on such large scale that is not present in the, in the world of, of space engineering. And so I think by inviting those people into the field of space uh, engineering, I think there, that's, there is a lot of potential there. So that's one of the, one of the cases that we make uh, in our paper, basically, like, listen, this is a, a two-way conversation. And then we also suggest some particular directions, some specific directions that we believe uh, are interesting and important to research, to advance uh, space farming. Yeah, so what, 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 so what, yeah, what are the current obstacles on food production in Mars? Maybe anything actually, in particular. I, uh, yeah, actually, I don't think there are any real obstacles left any longer, to be honest. Mm. Uh, I think we have the operational knowledge to build a growth chamber on, on the moon, maybe on Mars, uh, but we need to get there first. We have a tinder, <laughs> so before we can start growing something on Mars, maybe we should set foot on Mars, I guess. Uh, but there is nothing that really prevents us from designing a system to grow 
a crop on the moon, for example. All the operation launch is there. It's all a question about budget and just getting it done. Um, a good example of um, a system that is somewhat similar to this is the Eden ISS experiment um, from the German Space Agency, DLR, in collaboration with Wageningen. So it's a Wageningen project. And it was basically a sort of container um, in which uh, crops were grown in Antarctica. And um, it basically provided, I think during six or nine months, it provided fresh food in the middle of Antarctica for uh, the German uh, uh, research base there. And I don't need to tell you, in the middle of this environment, growing fresh, healthy produce months on end, on end is quite, quite a, an accomplishment, of course. And so we can actually do this. And I must correct and, and something that pe many people think. We're probably not going to build greenhouses on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. Um, we're gr probably going to use growth chambers, which are um, growth rooms that are completely isolated from the outside world to protect, protect them from radiation. And uh, the main advantage of a growth chamber is essentially to, you can you can totally control the climate and the conditions in which the plants plants grow in detail. If you're depending on the sunlight on Mars, for example, yeah, that's just too um, uh, too variable. And also, it's just the sunlight, the intensity of the sunlight on Mars is too low. And on top of that, there's dust storms that would cover your greenhouse. You would have to remove the sand. It's just too, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to do that, especially in terms of radiation. That would be the biggest problem, probably. So we have that operational knowledge on how to build a highly functioning growth chamber producing a lot of food over a very long period of time. So it is a question of translating that into a mission, into a package for the surface uh, of the moon or for, yeah. So, so also sounds like a lot of artificial intelligence needs to, to be applied in some sense. Well, our AI is a buzzword, of course, and yeah, um, yeah. you could do this with or without AI. It, I think AI definitely is, has a role to play, especially in figuring out how to how to find particular um, combinations of environmental conditions to generate a particular crop with a particular uh, with, with particular properties. So you could, there's, for example, the idea of light recipes, for example, which is you tune the different aspects, the different properties of your lighting system, which could be intensity and spectrum and frequency of flickering or flashing for LED lights. You can tweak all that to produce a, a plant with a particular shape and a particular nutritional content, right? But that's just the light. Mm -hmm. And if we take into account all the other aspects, well, that becomes pretty complicated. And you, you can basically use AI to figure out, you know, if you want to achieve this crop with this kind of properties, this is the kind of environmental conditions you need to, you need to set in motion. But it's not like we're gonna die without AI uh, growing crops on the moon. But there are a few things that are still, you know, that we still need to figure out. And I think one of the things that is a little underestimated is the role of microbiology. Um, and especially root microbiology, the microbes and the fungi living in soil or in a substrate, when you're using um, a substrate in, instead of traditional soil, um, the role of microbes on and around the roots in determining the health and the productivity of crops. And that is a huge field. Um, even on Earth here, we still need to learn a lot about it. We only know a bit about it, but it's still in a very open field. And I think once we understand much more about this, I think we will. this will be very beneficial to be used on Earth. And another obstacle is that we still don't know, we still don't know enough about the relation between DNA and particular growth characteristics. There is still a lot of room for improvement there and a lot of room for um, discovery there. So uh, if we want to develop a highly technological form of agriculture, well, we still have a long way to go, but it doesn't mean that we, can or we can't, we're not ready to already start producing crops in space. Inspiring, definitely. Um, yeah, so uh, what about aliens then? Uh, why we haven't met them yet? <laughs> That's uh, that's uh, an entirely 
Well, yeah, actually, it's quite a big, big jump. Yeah. No, it's not so much. Actually, it's not so much of a big jump. It's. Um, I'm always telling people there is space biology, what I just talked about. It's how, what is the impact of the space environments on, on organisms from Earth? And then there's astrobiology, which is really focusing on how did life mm. arise and is there life out there? And astrobiology is not necessarily interested in, in, in extraterrestrial intelligence. It's simply looking where are conditions for life to emerge and where should we start looking for? Of course, Mars is a big, is a big one. Um, but there are other places in, um, in our solar system where we could, uh, could, could go and, uh, and look, look for Mars. Some people talk about Titan, some people talk about Enceladus. So there are all kinds of, 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 of moons, for example, from bigger planets in the solar system where there might be life. And that's really the focus of astrobiology. So when you're asking me about astrobiology, about yeah, the chances of finding life through the lens of astrobiology, I think most people in my field will agree that it's pretty realistic to find some small bacteria or organism out there in our solar system or beyond. It's, it's well, with all the millions of years we've been, billions of years this universe has been rolling, the chances are quite real. Um, intelligence, that's a different story. The thing is, intelligence is actually not conducive for survival. It's a bit weird, but it's, it's actually what it is. Look at, look at humanity. Um, we're not going in a good way. On a political, social, and technological way, we're destroying the planet. Global action seems to be stuck because humanity cannot think in global terms. Um, polarization is huge. Politics are going south. I mean, hopefully tomorrow we'll get a, a, bit, of, a bit of a change. That's my, my hope, but you know, we, you never know. Um, so an, an intelligence can really work against an organism. Um, and I'm a little concerned that this might happen over and over again. And it's a bit of a pessimistic view. I'm not lying. I'm not going to lie here, but that civilizations often end up destroying themselves. And because the time frame of the, the existence of the universe is so big, um, and then assuming that civilizations might be temporary because they end up somehow either destroying themselves, either because of some cosmic calamity, they change. The, the chances that they overlap in time and they can actually communicate with each other are very slim. Um, so that's why I'm not so sure how you would focus on, on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And personally, I'm much more focused on uh, when I'm thinking about these things and, and reading about it, I'm much more focused on the more traditional approach from astrobiology, which is really about, you know, how, did, how does life arise? What are the, the, the building, the minimal building blocks you need and the, the range of environments in which life can arise? And can we find those conditions in, in outer space? Yeah, I, I love these topics. Uh, what would be uh, several books that you would suggest uh, uh, to read, or maybe maybe put it a little bit more broad. What were the most influential books in your life uh, that uh, sh helped help to shape your mind? <laughs> well, uh, obviously, there's been a bit of uh, science fiction. Mm. Um, that that's been a bit. It, it's been quite influential, of course. Um, there. Well, this the the um, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about particular particular names now uh, that, has, that escaped me now. Um, there is The Player of Games by Ian Banks, that's it. Uh, Ian Banks has a very interesting uh, series and The Player of Games is, is I think this, the second um, in this particular series, um, which is a, pr a pretty fantastic uh, science fiction game. Normally I'm not so much into space opera, but this one is really uh, giving it a very fresh spin. And um, so that's definitely a, a book and a series um, that, I, that I definitely would, um, would, would um, suggest to read. Yes. Um, other books, well, the thing is, the thing is with books, I'm not just, I'm not just restricted to scientific books or science fiction yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm actually, I'm actually interested in so many different books. Um, and for example, 
uh, Leuve Renoir from um, Marguerite Jursenaar, which is a, she's a French Belgian author, was a book that was hugely influential to me. It was actually a book about, um, about um, it's basically a Renaissance uh, position book. And what I found very inspirational about this book was basically that the main character is a sort of uh, scientist, but he's been living in, in very um, uh, restless times. There's a lot going on, a lot of upheaval is going on, uh, religious wars, the past and everything. And so he's as much a philosopher as he is a practicing scientist. Um, and this, this character was hugely, hugely influential to me and, and as something that I really almost aspire to, 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 to become myself, you know, in, in, in this way. So both, um, both historical books and books that give a, a, a more bigger picture on life as specific science fiction books uh, have, been, have been really uh, influential. And then this is Kim Stanley Robinson, who has written the Mars Trilogy, for example, which is another science fiction book, which is, um, which is, which is very interesting. Uh, the Three Body Problem, which is a really famous Chinese science fiction novel. So there's all kinds of all kinds of, uh, of books out there, of course. Um, yeah, don't, I, it's 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 such an open question that I'm I'm like, well, yeah, that's I'm even. I even like yeah yeah I even like reading um, uh, graphic novels. They're also oh, inspiration. Yeah. I'm reading a saga which is a science fiction, uh, kind of science fiction graphic novel, which is really good. Um, so yeah, there's so yeah, much I just recently found out about the graphic novels. It's fantastic. Uh, it, it, yeah, yes. everybody has this assumption that, that this is, oh, comics, uh, let it be. But this is a uh, comics for adults, right? It's uh, it's so much more inspiring. So, so all these visuals. Uh, yes, yeah. and, and of course, even uh, there's also really interesting manga, uh, Japanese manga, and I'm not talking about I mean, of course, there's a cute manga with the characters with the big eyes that we associate with manga, but there's, there's very different manga uh, series out there uh, that are just telling different stories and in a different visual style as well. So both graphic novels, American comics, Japanese manga. Um, I'm always a bit biased towards science fiction when I'm reading those, um, but are also part of my inspiration. And then the last thing that I'm also... Uh, apart from obviously science fiction series and movies, you know, on mm. TV, um, is computer games. I'm an avid gamer, uh, and also really got get inspiration from computer games. And, and I'm, I've been diving um, into the Mass Effect trilogy. Uh, Mass Effect is this game trilogy, and there's a fourth one, but that's not a very successful uh, installment of the series. But the first three ones are really legendary games. It's one big story arc, and it's about uh, it's it's space opera basically. It's about uh, a future time when different races are living in the war in, in the universe. Um, but it's actually the the writing of it is is done in a pretty smart way. The kind of conversations that are happening in the storyline make you think uh, much more beyond than than the, the casual entertainment. So it's it's. It's pretty well done. So the, for me, the, it's really the combination of all those different things that, that inspire me on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, then maybe finally, what would be your advice for future students who are coming, yeah, ambitious, uh, ready to change the world? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's to, te to team up. Uh, it's probably. I mean, if you if you you can you can you can create change by yourself. Of course, you can have a very popular YouTube channel, for example, and have a lot of impact. You can be an influencer on Instagram, have a lot of impact. But I think by teaming up, um, you can you can achieve so much more. So I think co-creating and teaming up are really really key. Um, and then secondly, definitely, if you have those multiple interests, to develop those multiple interests parallel and to seek out connections between those interests. And even if people look at you like, why are you doing this? Or why are you jumping around? Um, don't, don't worry too much about it. The connections will be made and will, you will discover them along as you go. Um, so that I, think, I think those are, are two really main, main challenges, uh, main, main advice, uh, points of advice. Um, connect if you wanna accomplish certain things, build a community around your idea. Uh, and secondly, um, 
do not let social pressure push you into a particular corner, but really follow those different interests you have, even though it's not clear how you're going to make a living out of it straight away. Just keep keep developing those. Experiment and uh, risk it, right? Yeah, experimentation and taking a risk yes. in, in life. Yeah, it's uh, yes, and 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 mm. working. Don't always make a blueprint. Just just trust on the emergence of solutions and ideas, and and instead of waiting for the ultimate blueprints where everything is laid out and go like, okay, I have my five year plan. Um, just start, you know, and see where it takes. You. Explore, yeah, space exploration, self exploration, life exploration. Yeah, exactly.